Man. We have a liftoff. To do that, you had to be believers. You could not harbor one small doubt that the job couldn't be done. For the moment, man on the way to the moon. Americans were willing to take risks in the space program because they were afraid. They were afraid that the Russians were better than Americans. When you're afraid, you'll do a lot of things. Challenger now heading down range. I flew Challenger's first flight. I accept failure. I accept deaths. I accept a risk. I don't like it, but I accept it. And catastrophe, it's part of the space business. The point of putting humans in space was to beat the Russians. Once we beat the Russians, there was no other reason to go. Looking good here for separation. We can be on Mars 25 years from now. If we're able to do it, let's do it. Frankly, that's how we get a deficit. If the Sheikh of Abu Dhabi or the Sultan of somewhere else decided out of the goodness of his heart simply to give us the money to do this and said, here it is, it's free money, I'd be all for it. Capcom, we're go for landing. My envision of a universe that is awesome beyond belief. There are many reasons in the human spirit which sooner or later will take us out there and it's just a question of who and when. Tonight, CBS reports. Space, last frontier or lost frontier? With correspondent Connie Chung. Humans had been on Earth for two million years before the Wright brothers took the flyer into the air at Kitty Hawk. Incredibly, within a lifetime of that historic flight, Americans stepped on the moon. Good evening, I'm Connie Chung. That moon landing happened 25 years ago, on July 20th, 1969. Men and women envision themselves visiting the moon by now, even living in space. But instead of speeding upwards, human space flight has fallen backwards. Washington's Air and Space Museum is a good place to begin our investigation of why the last frontier that 25 years ago seemed so near now seems farther away. Every morning when I come to work, it's been play the stars and stripes. You get up for the game. I mean, just be there right from the very beginning. Gene Krantz didn't need music to be pumped up 25 years ago. He was a flight director for Apollo 11. Good morning. Man is about to launch himself on a trip to the moon. Man begins the greatest adventure in his history. We are now part of this giant play, this act a series of events with escalating intensity that would get us there and it wasn't just enough to get to the moon we had to get the guy back and it's just five minutes to the historic launch of apollo 11 with astronauts armstrong collins and aldrin sitting there atop the saturn rocket getting ready for launch here's jack king and launch control counting skip chauvin informing the astronauts that the swing arm now coming back what goes through your mind is a mental gritting of your teeth until the critical parts of the mission are over. T minus one minute, 54 seconds and counting. The risks were there, there's no question. You don't put an individual on top of tons of propellant and then move him to thousands of miles per hour and say, gee, this is a piece of cake. 35 seconds and counting. We are still go with Apollo 11. The responsibility seemed so great that it was almost ponderous as we counted down toward the liftoff. 20 seconds and counting. We were aware of the tension in the air as the count proceeds down from 15. T minus 15 seconds, guidance is internal. 12, 11, 10, 9, ignition sequence starts. The engines are ignited at round 6 and we started to lift. 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. And of course in the first 12 seconds before the bottom of the rocket clears the gantry, if there's a deviation in the trajectory, things could begin to come apart. But those are just the kind of things you hope are not going to happen. Liftoff. We have a liftoff. 32 minutes past the hour. Lift up on Apollo 11. Boy. What a moment. Man on the way to the moon. It was something that had to grip you. It was as if you could have stood at the dock and waved goodbye to Columbus. 
that this was successful. This was a date that was going to be in all the history books from time evermore. The Saturn V rocket left Cape Kennedy right on schedule. Two days later, the astronauts watched the Earth rise over the moon, and Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin prepared to leave Mike Collins alone in orbit to begin their descent to the lunar surface. Okay, all flight controllers, internal status check, go, no, go for separation. Retro? Go. Fido? Go. Guidance? Go. Control? Go. Telcom? Go. GNC? Go. Ecom? Go. Surgeon? Go. Capcom looking good here for separation. The tricky part was the landing itself. Everything was being tested for the first time with those two men aboard. And it was about as tense as you can get. Fido says we're go, altitude 9,200 feet. 830, you're looking great. Everything went fairly well as we got close and we started in the descent. Then it seemed like the bottom fell out. I do understand. Go for landing. 3,000 feet. Roger, 1201 alarm. We started having these alarms in the computer and 1201 and 1202 were the numbers on them and I had not the foggiest clue of what they were, but Steve Bales did. The computer's trying to tell you something's wrong. It can be fairly benign, it can be deadly, it can mean you got to stop, or it could be somewhere in between. 1201. 1201, Roger, 1201 alarm. The 1201 alarm meant the computer was overloaded and not to be trusted. It was up to Steve Bales, age 26, to recommend the landing be aborted or to ignore the alarm and go ahead. All I wanted was for this thing to be over. I felt like I was in a car wreck that was just going on and it wouldn't stop. Position two, all flight controllers, 20 seconds to go, no go for landing. Bales was looking at the other things the computer was doing and he'd come back and say, hey, it looks like the computer's doing all the right stuff. We're go to continue. And I'm sitting there white as a sheet. Okay, all flight controllers, go to go for landing. Retro. Go. Fido. Go. Guidance. Go. Speed was still fine. Altitude was still fine. And all I could do was say, go, as loud as I could. His final goes, I didn't even need a headset. Econ. Go. Surgeon. Go. Capcom, we're go for landing. Eagle Houston, you're go for landing. Over. When we got below 1,000 feet, the computer alarm would come on, and Neil's looking out the window to, to look at exactly where the computer was taking us to land. The guidance system was taking him into the big boulder field, and so he had to level off and scoot forward at a high velocity, and he was whizzing across the lunar surface. Manual attitude control is good. Roger, copy. We were wondering why in the hell he was doing that, because two minutes from then, we are going to run out of fuel. Altitude, velocity, light. And ass down. It was dicey. It was tight all the way down. It was so quiet, mission control. And I mean, it was just like, <gasps> are you going to make it? 30 feet down, two and a half. Picking up some dust. 30 feet, two and a half down. Great shadow. I just sort of had this feeling, well, let's, you know, let's keep it going, bring it on down. There was a busy few seconds right there. Contact light. OK, engine stop. We copy you down, Eagle. Tranquility Base here. The Eagle has landed. Roger, Tranquility. We copy you on the ground. You got a bunch of guys about to turn blue. We're breathing again. Thanks a lot. We had just about run out of gas. The engine shut down, at which time the viewing room behind me started cheering and applauding and clapping. And this was the one thing that I was not prepared for. And for those one or two seconds, I was speechless to think, my God, we actually landed. I had just as long as NASA did to prepare for that landing on the moon. <laughs> Boy. <laughs> and when it happened, I was just dumbfounded by the great success of it and, the, and that historical moment of our being able to watch as it took place a man standing on the surface of the moon. That's one small step for man. One After I got off the shift, uh, went outside, and the moon was going down. And I can remember looking up, you know, and they're there. We had a part in it, and a great sense of pride. Magnificent flight out here. Magnificent desolation. Armstrong and Aldrin spent almost 22 busy hours on the moon, collecting rocks, taking pictures, placing an American flag and a plaque that read, we came in peace for all mankind. All they had to do now was get home alive. Nine, eight, seven, six, five, port stage, engine arm acid, proceed. Shadow, 
Beautiful. Engine's firing. They're on the way. Oh, boy. Hot <laughs> dickety dog, huh? Off and running now. Yes, sir. On the way back now to rendezvous with Mike Collins orbiting overhead. Oh, that was a great relief. <laughs> and my God, we did it. After a journey of eight days and almost 500,000 miles, the spacecraft re-entered the Earth's atmosphere. Seeing those three parachutes come out, seeing those men land on the water back from the moon Recovery one. was a fantastic feeling of success that we had gotten them there and back safely. I, I can't think of a better feeling. Ruffles and flourishes. Here they come, the three astronauts, Armstrong, Aldrin, and Collins, moving swiftly into the mobile quarantine facility. Once we were down, I saw the portrayal of some of the television announcers talking about and, and sort of being lost for words at, at the moment of our launch or the moment of our landing. And, and all of a sudden, this thought came into my mind, and I reached over to Neil, and I said, Neil, look, we missed the whole thing. President signaling for applause from the crowd. Astronauts gather in the window. Going to the moon certainly changed our lives tremendously, but it also had an impact on the lives of people who were around to witness that. And it wasn't the rocks, it wasn't knowledge, it wasn't they witnessed history. I can't ever look at the moon without thinking we were there and without feeling the importance to our country in getting served because I feel it helped our people, I helped that our leadership posture, it helped our economy, helped many things. But I think more than that, I think it helped our young folks to have belief and to commit themselves to do tough things also. Now, 25 years later, as I look at the moon, it seems much further away. It seems like we can't get there. You know, there's no spaceships available we could use. There's no big rockets. And really and truly, it is further away. Because if someone said, let's go next week, or let's go even a year or two years from now, we couldn't get there. So it's kind of drifted away. And maybe that's the way dreams do. The world of dreams meets the world of reality when we return. gave a waitress a $2 million tip. Critics are falling in love with the most romantic comedy of the year. It's like a fairy tale. Four stars. It could happen to you. Rated PG. Sneak preview Saturday night. Everybody's talking about new Everclean wall paint, only from Sherwin-Williams. Right now, buy Everclean at the regular price, and you'll get our best roller cover absolutely free. It's all here at Sherwin-Williams Paint America Sale. Ask Sherwin-Williams. They came from Alaska and North Dakota, California, and even farther west. This summer, we invited everyone who owns a Saturn to visit us in Tennessee, the place their car was born. We called it the Saturn Homecoming. People could see where their cars had been built and spend some time with the men and women who built them. They could see where the idea for a new kind of car company had taken shape, and we could thank them for believing we could do it. 44,000 people gave up their usual summer vacations to spend them with us at a car plant. Pretty good turnout for our first big party. Of course, not everything went exactly the way we'd planned. But we were all in it together, the way we always have been. Every year, American business wastes millions of dollars on international calls by using the wrong long-distance company. Now you don't have to waste that money. Introducing MCI's Proof Positive Worldwide. Save up to 50% off typical international calls around the world. Call by September 30th and get one month of free long-distance. Call MCI now and put your money back in your business. Order a Domino's pizza, tune into CBS Monday night, and take off to the Bahamas. Look in the July 16th TV guide or on Domino's box tops for a getaway for nothing entry form. Saturday, a young secretary held hostage. Walker, please help me. What will Walker do to set her free? <laughs> Let her go, Bodine. Walker, Texas Ranger. Angela Lansbury stars in Murder, She Wrote, Sundays on CBS. Five, four, three, two, one. 
zero. All engines running, commit, liftoff. And I think it's gonna be a long, long time. Going to the moon thrilled the nation. Americans were ecstatic. Elton John's Rocket Man reflected the mood of the country. Roger. Contact light. Roger, copy contact. Next to Dance by the Light on the Moon were Pete Conrad. And that may have been a small one for Neil, but that's a long one for me. And Alan Bean. I can remember standing on the moon looking at the Earth and saying, there's the Earth. You know, it's way out there, 239,000 miles away. And I kept thinking, you know, everybody's there. It was only about this big. And to just think that everybody I'd seen on TV was there, and all my friends were there, and everybody I'd seen at the Super Bowl was there. It was hard to believe. And I kept thinking, boy, that's a long way home. But at home, much of the moon glow was fading. After the Apollo landing, the American public sort of turned away from the space program. We had other concerns at the time. We were paying for the Great Society programs that Lyndon Johnson had started. The Vietnam War was ongoing. And public support for space more or less dissipated. A rocket man. Yeah. We're doing uh, 10 clicks, Tony. The first time is the one that most people remember. Then I'll tell you, Andy's never seen a driver like this. But there were five more trips to the moon. Wow, what a place. What a view, isn't it, John? It's absolutely unreal. Twelve men had the experience of their lives. Hippity hoppity, hippity hoppin' over hill and dale. Ah, the old footprints on the crater rim. Look at the size of that rock. The closer I get to it, the bigger it is. Boy, that is absolutely beautiful. Get the bird in your eye, Houston. Yeah. Hold still. There you go. Let me have it, John. Okay. I tell you, Houston, my general impression of this thing is I'm a lot more surprised at how uh, really beat up this place is. It's just craters on top of craters on top of craters. Sure you want to rock that big, Houston? Uh-oh. I know you can't see it from where you are, Jack, but I guess we got to leave. Otherwise, it'd be nice to sample that dark stuff up on top. We need you guys rolling in seven minutes. That will be the bottom of the ninth inning as far as manned exploration of the moon is concerned. Ignition. Right away, Houston. I misread what the Apollo program was about uh, at the beginning. I was a newly minted PhD, and uh, I somehow had gotten the foolish idea that it was about science. Um, but clearly it wasn't. And the fact, now often forgotten, is the purpose for going had little to do with discovery and everything to do with the Cold War. CBS Television presents a special report on Sputnik 1, the Soviet space satellite. Sputnik, the first satellite to orbit Earth. It's hard to believe how small it is, the size of a beach ball, only 184 pounds. It carried no missiles, yet it created the impact of an atom bomb. The Russians have licked some of the toughest problems of rocket propulsion, the basis of the so-called ultimate weapon, the long-range ballistic missile. As it kept circling the world, it incessantly beeped an ominous message. Communism is all-powerful. The Americans were afraid. They were afraid that the Russians were better than Americans, that their science was better, that their schools were better, that their technology was better. Three and a half years later came another sneak attack, the results more devastating than Sputnik. A Russian, Yuri Gagarin, had become the first human to fly in space. President John Kennedy desperately needed to fight back. Kennedy wrote a memorandum to Lyndon Johnson. He said, find me a space program which promises dramatic results in which we could win. Kennedy chose a goal that was bold, thrilling, expensive, and perilous land a man on the moon, ahead of the Soviets, and before the decade was out. How much of the purpose was science and how much of the purpose was political? It was 100% political. Going to the moon was as much a weapon in the Cold War as missiles, technology, tanks, and troops. I believe that this nation should commit itself to achieving the goal before this decade is out 
of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the Earth. When Americans landed on the moon in the last year of the decade, President Kennedy and America had won the race to space. The point of putting humans in space was to beat the Russians. The political purpose was accomplished, and uh, the, the reality is that there was no other reason to go. The space program was facing a crisis. And here we had a NASA, uh, uh, centers, civil servants, universities, industrial contractors, congressional committees, pol political figures, presidents, senators, all of whom had embraced all this and were united by this successful vision. What do you do? From triumph to tragedy, when we return. The new Accordi X Coupe. There's more horsepower. Handling and comfort are perfectly balanced. It has dual airbags and anti-lock brakes. We've taken it about as far as you can go. The new Accord EX Coupe from Honda. Introducing the most durable bounty ever. It does jobs I never thought a paper towel could do. Now it's the Quilted Picker Upper. The Quilted Quaker Picker Upper. It even scrubs the carpet. Ordinary towels fall apart, even top quality towels, but new Quilted Bounty's this much stronger. It's still quicker, too. The Quilted Quaker Picker Upper. New Quilted Bounty. Bounty. Here's a health tip from MetLife. Chronic stress can change your personality. It can make you lose sleep, give you headaches, make you feel anxious, even make you cranky and irritable. But you can learn to handle stress with deep breathing, exercise, or even just happy thoughts. For more information about handling stress, phone for your free MetLife booklet. Well over a century, it's been the greatest show on earth. It's the 1994 Ringling Brothers and Barnum and Bailey Circus. And when it pulls into your town this year, bring your wide-eyed sense of wonder and your Visa card. Because this circus will take you back to when you were a kid, but it won't take American Express. Visa, it's everywhere you want to be. If your spouse was accused of poisoning your child... I didn't kill my baby. Would you believe she was innocent? I never stopped loving you. Lisa Hartman Black, Without a Kiss Goodbye, Sunday. Every Friday night, you can watch a news magazine. Or you can watch Picket Fences. They're both about real life and real issues. But the difference is dramatic. Very. Very. Dramatic. Tom Skerritt, Picket Fences, Fridays. Richard Nixon was president. The future of America's space program was in his hands. This is a computer simulation of the future of the United States in space. When senior advisor Caspar Weinberger suggested not renewing the moon program, President Nixon wrote, I agree. Mr. Nixon discarded any notion about flying human beings beyond the moon. So there was no reason for an intermediate space station. The only big project left was the shuttle. The shuttle was to be a service vehicle to the station. But if you take the station away, what are you left with? A vehicle with nowhere to go. But President Nixon had no desire to halt the shuttle. He agreed manned flight enhanced America's superpower image, wanted to create 24,000 projected shuttle jobs, and wished to stay in the White House. For Nixon, it was rather crassly an element in the 1972 election. It created jobs in aerospace uh, in key electoral states. Between the war abroad and problems at home, federal bills were mounting. Yet the $6.5 billion shuttle program was approved. 
Sunday, April 12th, 1981, Kennedy Space Center, Florida. Nine years later and three and a half billion dollars over budget, the space shuttle was ready for its maiden voyage. 14 stories high, 2,000 tons. This is Columbia, the spaceship that will orbit the Earth. The shuttle was as challenging to 20th century engineers as building the pyramids was to the ancient Egyptians. It had to be both a rocket and a plane, a cargo ship and a science lab, reusable, affordable to build, and economical to fly. If it succeeds, the space shuttle will truly be a remarkable flying machine. The drama was set. Apollo, the sequel. T minus 10, 9, 8, 7, 6. Anxious onlookers crowded onto the land and sea, hoping for the rekindling of space glory. Booster, go. GNC, go. Eagle, go. Go at 40, Capcom. Columbia, Houston, you're going at 40. Hey, a map looks good here. Uh, what a view, what a view. This thing is just performing, just outstanding. Roger, we agree with that. Well, many, many hours went into this thing. A job well done by the shuttle space team. Shuttle won rave reviews, especially from NASA. Turn into the runway. Right on the money. The public was totally won over. It was so beautiful for NASA that before long, Florida's Kennedy Space Center started looking like New York's Kennedy Airport. And America's first woman astronaut. The shuttle's primary use? Launching communication satellites. Even secret military satellites. But back on Earth, a disturbing question was being raised by scientists and space experts. Was putting men and women into orbit the best way to target space? We've landed spacecraft on Mars and made a preliminary look for life. We have sent four spacecraft beyond the outermost planets. We've examined every planet known to the ancient. Weather satellites, communication satellites, treaty verification and military reconnaissance satellites. Everything I've just said can be done without people and therefore at five or ten percent the cost of a comparable human mission. We care a lot about human life in this country. Given the presence of human beings on our space flights, we are going to spend an enormous amount of money not to improve our ability to find things out, but to protect them. What that means is that the cost of a manned space flight, as opposed to the cost of an unmanned space flight, will be enormously greater for no gain other than the safety of the individuals. And it's not just the money to keep astronauts alive on the shuttle. The machine had problems of its own. Well, shuttle was promised to be easy to operate, inexpensive, routine, reliable. And it's none of those. It's turned out to be expensive, uh, cranky, uh, probably excessively risky, and difficult to operate. Houston is now controlling. It costs $500 million every single time it flies, far more than promised. In the four and a half years after its first flight, 23 crews took it up and down safely. But astronauts like Story Musgrave, who flew it, had misgivings. I knew the shuttle was a vulnerable bird and a dangerous bird, and I knew what the odds were because I knew the technology. I'd helped build the shuttle from just the very the concept on. I'm very scared about launches. Launches are vibrations and noise and, uh, you know, incredibly dynamic and fast, violent kinds of releases of energy. That's what a launch is all about. And uh, they scare me. They're more risk than I, than I like taking. Space is my calling. But if you could have uh, Scotty beam me up there, I would go that way. Then came the morning of January 28, 1986. The Challenger, the workhorse of the fleet, was ready for another takeoff. The first part of its mission was routine, launch two satellites into space. 
it was the second part that seized the public's attention. And I just hope everybody tunes in on day four now to watch the teacher teaching from space. Take 37-year-old teacher Krista McAuliffe, mother of two, into orbit. Back in Concord, New Hampshire, her high school social studies class was watching. Eight, seven, six. We have main engine start. Four, three, two, one, and liftoff. Liftoff of the 25th Space Shuttle mission, and it has cleared the tower. Krista McAuliffe's parents and the world would watch the horrific explosion. All seven astronauts were killed. Kept alive by President Ronald Reagan, with few questions asked, was the shuttle program. Every family member I talked to asked specifically that we continue the program, that that is what their departed loved one would want above all else. That is the way we shall commemorate our seven Challenger heroes. I was confident the space program was going to recover and move forward. You have to be honest, it didn't. After the Challenger exploded, uh, it was sort of a rude awakening for a lot of people. It's unfortunate that it was a rude awakening because that's what America is not about. America is about taking risk, doing bold things. Are you saying that the loss of life is part of the cost of exploration? Yes. those astronauts die in vain? Ooh, um, you know, I mean, I, it, and I don't mean to sound callous like that, but it's hard to see what the positive advantage was. I would have hoped that the lesson, the real lesson from the Challenger was that manned spaceflight is probably riskier than it's worth, or at least worth doing routinely just for the sake of doing it. That is, it's worth the risk sometimes if you have a mission that really requires people in space, but just to send a teacher up to go around in orbits uh, strikes me as a senseless stunt. I thought it was a good idea. I really did. And having a teacher teach lessons from space, I think, would inspire other teachers, um, obviously the students. I um, thought it was a good idea. And I think, we'll, I think eventually NASA will go back to that. Two, one, zero, and liftoff. Liftoff. Americans return to space as Discovery clears the tower. When shuttles again started streaking upwards nearly three years later, NASA's near-perfect public image had been so severely damaged that its early hopes to fly people beyond the moon and to Mars lay in ruins. Three engines at 65% now. I certainly think that the American people are much more risk-averse today than they were in the 1960s. They're also less patient. Spaceflight is a risky business. Everyone I know at NASA and in the space community at large believes that there will be another challenger. It'll either be a catastrophic accident on launch or on landing, something terrible happen again. That's all part of the risk of space flight. And the question is how the American Republic will respond next time. When we come back, human space flight's newest agenda. I can fight a disease. I can cure a disease. Is it new hope or the same old hype? It could be the food. It could be the countryside. It could be the wine. Whatever it is, we really like this place.
What's been added to Nabisco shredded wheat? Not fat. Definitely not sugar. And not a pinch of salt. Because unlike those other leading cereals, Nabisco shredded wheat is made from just pure, delicious, 100% whole grain wheat. So, what's been added to Nabisco shredded wheat? Milk's good. Nabisco shredded wheat. It's just naturally good. CBS Reports will continue in a moment. When it's too hot to sleep. Wow! Cool down with Dave. I'm Dave. I'm your host. Guess you're real proud of that, huh? <laughs> His fly was undone. What you want to hear? Scary. Yeah. Don't look like an idiot. Watch this move right here. The Late Show with David ah. Letterman. I can be quite provocative. Hot summer fun. We're so hot. She had some eyes. Weeknights on CBS. You know, it's like Woodstock every night. This is CBS. Continental flies more non-stops out of the New York area than any other airline. It's more airline for your money. A few of the tri-state quality Ford dealers feel I'm upstaging their cars. What, little old me? Only the Ford dealers have the number one selling car and truck in America again. And they have five of the ten best selling vehicles in America for the third straight year. Now how could I be more popular than that? Now you can get a great lease deal on a new Ford Taurus, the best selling car in America. So go tell your Ford dealer, is it going to be more of them or more of me? Can True Lies live up to its $100 million expectations? Get the answer in our True Lies special half hour only on Entertainment Tonight. Tomorrow at 7.30. And coming up on Channel 2 News at 11 o'clock, new exclusive information in the O.J. Simpson case is the daughter of O.J. and Nicole gives new details what happened the night of the... Now return to CBS Reports, Space, Last Frontier or Lost Frontier. When the shuttle started flying again after the Challenger disaster, many of its old jobs were gone. The military now used its own rockets to launch most of its space war satellites. Private industry had a green light to develop rockets to try to catch up with France and others. All the shuttle had left to do was space research. And so NASA started selling a new message. Space is the place for progress and profits back on Earth. Ignition and liftoff of Columbia in the first dedicated medical research flight. As NASA continues on the cutting edge of microgravity research. Space shuttle discovery and the upper atmosphere research satellite. Listen to astronauts and you'll believe they perform miracles in the heavens. Roger roll, Discovery. We are possibly the 20th flight overall to fly protein crystal growth. And this is important research that could one day lead to the cure for diseases like AIDS and cancer and, and emphysema and diabetes and so on. Because we are in a microgravity environment, we can grow a larger and more pure crystal so I can fight a disease, I can cure a disease. And that, I think, is very exciting stuff. Then again, listen to a world-famous astrophysicist there's been nothing that resulted from this, uh, essentially nothing, in the way of extraordinary pharmaceuticals or cures for disease or any extraordinary crystals which are revolutionized electronics. That's all false. It's not true. Entrepreneurs hoped it was true when they first looked at microgravity. They saw not fun, but profit. A major pharmaceutical firm tried to make a new drug in space. It failed. In fact, a competitor produced it first on Earth. Because the shuttle costs half a billion dollars per flight, any space experiments using astronauts must generate extraordinary payoffs on Earth. Today, the only major money being invested in space business research is NASA money. University of Houston physicist Alex Ignatiev gets some of those dollars. And this is the hangar, hangar S, where they had the, uh, the right stuff astronauts were in here originally. 
Now we'll sit, stand back and observe and we'll see the opening. I mean, this is, this is great stuff. To develop really, better really, semiconductor really materials really for cool things such films. as computers, Dr. Ignatiev created this wake and, uh, shield. This is during one of the unbirthing of the wake shield. Speeding uh, through space, it creates really a near-perfect vacuum. Behind the shield is a material that might make those better computer chips, gallium arsenide. I, I want to rotate it that way so I can get, this, get more room in here to work. The shield just returned from a spin through space. The focus on our part was that if we can develop new materials in that space environment that industry wants and needs, then you have a very strong driver for industry to use space. It's, uh, but even if the experiment works, is the huge cost worth it? I run a semiconductor company and I'm the director of a gallium arsenide semiconductor company, so I know about this stuff. And all I can say is this program of growing gallium arsenide wafers in space is a colossal con job. And there's no one I know in my industry that wants those wafers. There is no economic benefit to increasing the purity of a crystal beyond the point we can currently improve it. The cost is huge and the economic benefit is almost nil for that last step going up into space. Sometimes putting down big money for small returns is a great deal. Lives have been saved due to advances aided by space technology, CAT scans, MRIs, and cardiac pacemakers. Space research helped push cell phones, faxes, and miniature computers. It's only through research that we're going to get knowledge that's going to be for the betterment of society, one way or another. The acclaimed surgeon Michael DeBakey is using space-age technology to make a new heart pump. Here's a heart, and this is a pump going between the heart and the aorta. Think how small it is. We're dealing with lots of people who need this. People whose hearts have failed and there's nothing else to do for them except a heart transplant. We can't do heart transplants except on two, about 2,000 annually in this country. But critics maintain Dr. DeBakey could save far more lives if researchers did their work on Earth instead of in space. If your primary goal is medical research, then you would put the money into more focused medical research situations. You can talk to medical experts, scientists, yeah. and they will give you chapter and verse on the achievements right. that have been made. And those are achievements that would be useful if we had an unlimited amount of money. But if you said to any of those people, here is a fixed sum, the goal is to make substantial advances in our ability to fight disease. How would you spend it? I do not know any of them who would spend it on a manned space shot. T minus 10, go for main. Barney Frank has added up the figures, but left out the emotions. Human spaceflight is a lot like passion. The heart leads the mind. And lift off of the space shuttle Discovery with the Hubble Space Telescope, our window on the universe. But NASA's intentions were to win both hearts and minds on its historic discovery mission four years ago. Its crew was being sent to deploy the giant Hubble Space Telescope. Hubble was expected to fulfill the dreams of generations of astronomers, to peer into the farthest edges of the cosmos. The main problems that it, it was built to attack uh, are how unique is the Earth? That's a question that I think is, is of real philosophical interest. Are there other Earths out there? How old is the universe? How big is the universe? How did it begin? How will it end? Nobody slept for that, that entire week, and then it was a gradual realization over a period of several days that no matter what we did to focus the telescope, it just wasn't getting any better. The primary mirror had been ground to the wrong shape. The $2 billion Super Space Telescope is out of focus. NASA has been forced to admit the telescope is plagued with persistent fuzzy vision. NASA was losing its case in front of the whole world. NASA had to fix the telescope or else risk losing its budget for human space travel. And we have liftoff, liftoff of the Space Shuttle Endeavour on an ambitious mission to service the Hubble Space Telescope. All through the press, uh, they were always referring to this as a do or die mission. Um, and you know, we, we read it, we heard it, we were aware of that. Endeavour, you've got to go for capture. Hoffman and partners Story Musgrave, Tom Akers, and Kathy Thornton also knew their high-altitude surgery would have to be performed on a patient 43 feet tall, an extraordinary and dangerous operation. You can uh, completely close the doors now. Breathe a sigh of relief. Good work, guys. 
After a 35-hour operation, the surgery was declared a success. Endeavor Houston with the final chapter of the big picture. We are going toward a release. I think the Hubble repair was the greatest achievement since Apollo, it was probably as in the terms of the manned program. I think it's the most uh, conspicuous achievement, and I have very high regard for the people who pulled that off and did it. But the, it uh, corresponded to fixing something that was done the wrong way in the first place. Van Allen says the right way would be to put the Hubble not 327 miles high where the shuttle left it, but 22,000 miles high above the Earth's atmosphere where the view is not blocked by the Earth nearly half of the time, as it is now. If you were designing that mission appropriately and you really wanted to get the most payoff out of, that, out, of, out of those dollars, you would have designed two or three Hubble telescopes. You'd have launched them on expendable launch vehicles. You'd have put the first one up and see how it works. If there were problems, you'd have fixed the second one and then launched that. And you could have had a third one for less than the money of building the Hubble, launching it on the shuttle, and then going up on a shuttle to fix the thing. Surprisingly, even astronaut Story Musgrave agrees Hubble cannot be defended in terms of costs. Hubble is more than just science. It touches people because of the bridges in space and time that it can cross. It gets down to understanding what it is to be human, what is our place in the universe. You may feel anchored on Earth here. You may feel anchored into one path in your career or other parts of your life. Space provides a stimulus to pursuit. It provides even a stimulus toward a spiritual quest. See the entire continent of Australia from here. The whole thing. And you feel like kind of stretching out and playing Superman because if you ever had that fantasy, seeing an entire continent go by. Congress doesn't give space bucks without Buck Rogers. Cut humans out of space flight and about 130,000 aerospace jobs could be eliminated. And cities don't give parades for robots. In the galaxy of space politics, cheaper is not better. Without the manned programs, the unmanned programs, the science programs would never have gotten the amounts of money that they were asking for to do science. So one drives the other. And I think if you, if you kill the manned space flight program, it's sort of like, being, like killing the goose that laid the golden egg. Almost like a bird, Tom. Look at it. There it goes. Right behind us. <laughs> Next, the space race becomes a fight for survival. When we come back. I live with the times. Progress. To reveal new skin, I've discovered Plenitude XL A3 with triple fruit acids. An innovation from L'Oreal. XL A3 with triple fruit acids lifts away dull cells and reveals new skin. Its anti-free radical complex helps combat the signs of aging. Its sun filter helps protect from UV rays. XL A3 has visible results. Smoother skin, a brighter complexion. My skin has never looked so young. New Plenitude XL A3 from L'Oreal to reduce the signs of aging. Search. Search. What is it, boy? Hey, I think we got something over here. Good dog. Do I like ice cream? <laughs> My friends call me half pint, and it's not because of my size. I am an ice cream snob. Right away, I thought, healthy choice. But I was shocked. Chunks of brownies, chocolate-covered almonds, caramel, cappuccino, chocolate chunk. It's rich, creamy, with only two grams of fat. It's a miracle. <laughs> with healthy choice, low-fat ice cream, I eat what I like. Hey, have you heard the latest scoop? What's that? A serving of Kellogg's Raisin Bran cereal in milk. That's the two scoops thing, right? It's just 45 cents. It's news to me. Can I taste one? Please do. Mm. How about those raisins, huh? I see more than I can count. Raisins are looking good. And how does this look to you? Oh, I can't beat that. Everybody should have such a bargain. And now they do. Hit me with the headline. Kellogg's Raisin Bran for 45 cents. Just part of the value in having breakfast with Kellogg's. Kellogg's Raisin Bran. Excellent. <laughs> 
Millions of us watched the Simpson case unfold, but were the pictures different for blacks than for whites? I think it's uh, real obvious that, that uh, black people look at it a little differently than, than uh, white people do. If that's true, what does it tell us about ourselves? I in America looks for answers tomorrow on the CBS Evening News. Where are we going? Oh, okay. Look for the Maryland flag. Oh, yeah, there we go. <laughs> Dan Golden, head of NASA, has a mission on the ground. Mr. Golden. To prevent the dismantling of the entire human space program. Do you want to lobby me? No, I don't want to lobby you, but... Today, he's negotiating the corridors of Congress to save NASA's newest super project, the space station. That permanent laboratory in the sky rejected by President Nixon more than 20 years ago. This is the year America decides what we are and what we stand for. Are we going to be, make a statement to the world that we are going to provide world leadership in space? The price for that leadership is sky high. $70.8 billion to build and deploy the space station for 10 years. That's about 35 times the annual federal budget for cancer research, or the price of 35 stealth bombers. The arguments for the space station sound pretty much the same as NASA used when pushing for the space shuttle in the first place. What is the space station's primary purpose? The space station will help us understand how humans could live and work in space. Now why do we need to know that? We are a spacefaring society. If we are a spacefaring society, we must know how people live and work in space to take the next step. But there is no next step plan that would be helped by an intermediate step space station. The cost of a trip to Mars, the next logical place for humans to go, is astronomical. So why is the Clinton administration eager to build a space station? As in Kennedy's time, the answer can be found in Russia, this time with a twist. Now, America wants to help Moscow's leaders by having Russia and the U.S. jointly build a space station. Vice President Al Gore is leading the White House effort to team up. Number one argument for this is it's good for the space station itself. It's good, it saves us money. It gives us a better station in less time at less cost. But in addition, it's just a recognition of reality. They're either going to participate as partners in this international space program, or they're going to build ballistic missiles and sell them to bad guys around the world. Which of those two things do you want them to do? You know, this sounds so much like the old red scare technique that you're giving us. It's very, it's very different. It's not a red scare, it's just a fact. I am all in favor of America spending some money to employ Russian scientists so they're not tempted to go to work for crazy people who run countries like in Iraq or North Korea. The manned space program is a very inefficient way to do it. The house will be in order. Two weeks ago, human space flights struggle for survival won an important battle. The house voted to continue the joint space station. The Senate vote is expected this summer. Feel free to come in closely as you wish to. Only six blocks from the Capitol, the Air and Space Museum is the most popular in town. We're now looking at the Apollo 11 command module. Many Americans are too young to remember those glorious days 25 years ago. Exploration was easier back then. The goal was focused and the money flowed. Now, old and young face a huge budget deficit and the competing forces are fighting harder than ever for their shares of the limited funds. Back in Texas, there's another museum piece. Only this one is not under glass, but ready to fly. Again. Uh, an instrument check. Inside is Gene Kranz, who helped his country do the impossible, put Americans on the moon. Recently retired, he signed up to be a flight engineer on a World War II B-17 bomber to fly air shows. When much younger, Kranz stepped forward to accept President Kennedy's challenge. Anything that is tough is what is good for our country and our people and our youth. And I believe that our country, if it is to remain strong, must continue to lead. And that, to me, means we must continue to do difficult things. Those things that, that border almost in the impossible. Those things that rhyme with the Kennedy statement that uh, yeah, we go because it's difficult. Some final thoughts in a moment.
Up next on Channel 2 News, exclusive details from O.J. Simpson's nine-year-old daughter on what she heard the night her mother was murdered. Four innocent people are gunned down in a shooting tonight. We'll have a live report. He plays an international spy. Can Arnold pull off the hit he needs to get back on track? Channel 2 News at 11 is next. Join us. Every year, American business wastes millions of dollars on international calls by using the wrong long-distance company. Now you don't have to waste that money. Introducing MCI's Proof Positive Worldwide. Save up to 50% off typical international calls around the world. Call by September 30th and get one month of free long distance. Call MCI now and put your money back in your business. Some people say eating right means settling for less flavor. I say bologna. <laughs> well, like Healthy Choice cold cuts. We love them. The honey and the honey ham, it's delicious. With Healthy Choice, we get the great taste, we get the nutrition, we get it all. New for the first and only time on video, the best of The Tonight Show. Critics are calling it hilarious and entertaining. It's pure magic. Johnny's favorite moments from The Tonight Show, now on video, only $14.99 each. Space transcends differences. Everyone we spoke to says it is where people should go. The arguments are about the best ways to explore space, with machines or with humans, and whether ever scarcer dollars should go up to the sky or back home for social problems. 25 years ago, this nation shared a singular joy. That mood cannot be repeated by reminiscing, but in the passion and excitement of a new grand search, Maybe in space, maybe on Earth, maybe within ourselves. For CBS Reports, this is Connie Chun. Good night. Okay, Houston, as I stand out here in the wonders of the unknown at Hadley, I try to realize there's a fundamental truth to our nature. Man must explore. Tonight on The Late Show with David Letterman, Super Dave Osborne, Dave Letterman's mom, First Lady Hillary Clinton, 12-year-old bird caller Brad Privett, and Man of the Week, Regis Philbin, all tonight. Mark McEwen here. Thanks for making CBS America's most watched network. Now, your local news. To order a VHS cassette of CBS Reports, Space, Last Frontier, or Lost Frontier, please call toll-free 1-800-934-NEWS. That's 1-800-934-NEWS. For a transcript, send $7 to Transcripts, Box 7, Livingston, New Jersey, or call 1-800-777-TEXT. If you'd like to learn more about the extraordinary history and future of space, the Library of Congress suggests these books, Space Age by William J. Walter and Exploring Space by William E. Burroughs. These and many other interesting books are available at your local library and bookstore. Visit them. They'll be happy to help you read more about it. Experience CBS News. This is CBS.